Hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 85. Today's questions are taken from the video on the Enigma code device and the USS Gearing and its class of destroyer of the United States Navy. So let's get on with the questions from these two videos. Huey Nagoyan asks, how far in the design process do you spec suspect the later and more obscure Japanese Navy projects such as the triple turret heavy cruiser, i.e. the Zhao from World of Warships, were before they were put to the torch. And why is it that we have more information on certain designs on projects such as the B-65 compared to others? The reason why we have more information on some projects other than not others is, as I mentioned in the video on the Yamato class, the Japanese did their level best to burn everything, but they only burned some records. So <laughs> some records were preserved, perhaps unintentionally, others were more thoroughly destroyed and had to be recovered. Also, various projects were at various stages of development, so if the designer was still around and willing to cooperate, they could fill in some of the blanks if documents had been destroyed, which is some of the the material that we have on Japanese ships now is reconstituted stuff based on interviews and so forth. As far as the progress on things such as the triple turret heavy cruise up i don't think very far um the japanese had initially planned for what they termed a type cruisers which we would in the west probably call a heavy cruiser um, they had planned to build a bunch of those in what they call the circle five and circle six programs which were their sort of building plans for the upcoming uh, few years when the World War Two broke out and Circle 5 was cancelled in favour of, well, replacing and repairing stuff that was being damaged or lost in the war. Now, the A-type A cruisers that were designated for Circle 5 were instead replaced with Super A cruisers, which would be more commonly known to us as the B-65 designs and... So those those designs were advanced to a certain degree. They weren't finalised, but that's roughly what the Japanese wanted to build. But they were taking their time on finalising the designs because as a war broke out, so they were focusing on other things. That in turn meant that the A-type cruisers that they had planned for that circle, and then obviously the additional uh, A-type cruisers they had planned for Circle Six, their designs were well they had a uh, they had a spec and a general idea of what they wanted to work to and some basic outline of sort of these are the kind of weapons we want to use but that was pretty much it as far as anyone can tell and given that the b65s or super a's were kind of the lead item of circle five and they hadn't even finalized those i strongly suspect that there wasn't that much more on any A-type cruisers and such, like, beyond them, much more than a sketch design and maybe a rough idea of, of where they wanted to go for it. It certainly wouldn't be um, something for which you could point to a, a defined set of specs with a defined set of characteristics, because they, they wouldn't have got that far uh, during the war. Just as a quick item of interest, where... Again, we in the West might think of cruiser killers, heavy cruisers, light cruisers, and specialist cruisers. Um, the Japanese used a slightly different system. So as we said, they had the Super A designation, which was things like the B-65, i.e. the big cruiser killers. The A type, which was heavy cruisers with 8-inch guns. The B type, which was light cruisers with 6-inch guns. The C type, which was specialist cruisers uh, that weren't build, built up to the limit. So... Um, things like the Agano class or the Oyodo class, which are designed for either leading submarine or destroyer flotillas, etc. And then they also had an AA type, which, shockingly enough, <laughs> was anti-aircraft. Michael Hammond asks, During the rapid advancement of naval design and technology from 1850 to 1950, were there any naval technology-design ideas that never rose to prominence that you think could have been very successful with the proper research and development? 
there's quite a few ideas that would have played out to be very decisive weapons had technology stabilized around about the point that they were being developed but ended up being not just obsolete but completely bypassed by almost unrelated measures so one of my more favorite examples would be the martin's shell which was basically a a normal shell uh, at least of the 1850s, 1860s period. So imagine a cartoon bomb, <laughs> a big spherical thing with a fuse in it or something like that, um, but filled with molten iron, which turned out to be remarkably effective at setting things on fire. So in an era of steam-powered wooden warships and the early ironclads, this thing would have been absolutely terrifying. But unfortunately for the developers of the Martin Shell, they went ahead and developed ironclads and ironclads were significantly more proof against martin shell than wooden warships although it did stick around for a little while because there were still a lot of wooden warships around um but as a decisive battle winner for in this particular case the royal navy it's time to shine was maybe about sort of a five to ten year period between its invention and uh, the French fleet on the front lines, at least mostly becoming ironclad. Um, plus, there was the whole element of basically running a metal forge aboard a ship, which was somewhat inconvenient. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th th there's various ideas like that. Like, say, for example, uh, the pneumatic guns on the USS Vesuvius. Theoretically a good idea, um, especially in terms of stealth ability. And if they'd had further research and development to refine the technology, control the balance of air pressures, etc., and calibrate them a bit more, they wouldn't have been battle winners, but they might have been pretty useful, certainly in, say, well, the World War One period. Because remember, Vesuvius is quite small, so if they could work that technology a bit more... Um, get it to be a bit more reliable, maybe miniaturise it slightly, you might be able to have some kind of fixed spinal gun firing ridiculous amounts of very powerful explosive um, mounted to, say, a destroyer. And that's not necessarily going to sink a battleship, although it would be a bit of a bang. Um, but given that destroyers of the World War I period did end up getting frighteningly close to enemy battleships, uh, and cruisers at various points something like that might have allowed them to lob something of that nature either into the casement batteries or the superstructure and that would do a lot of a bang um, because well torpedoes obviously would do even more damage but torpedoes are slower and easier to evade um, guns not so much especially at that kind of point blank range so yeah you can imagine say the night engagement at Jutland where You've got the HMS Spitfire uh, encountering SMS Nassau. Now, historically speaking, Spitfire couldn't do much more than shave some armour off with its bow and run away with it laughing, but imagine if it had had sort of a 15-inch fixed uh, pneumatic gun that, again, flashless, so very suited for nighttime destroyer attacks. Um, they just sort of charged down the Nassau and then lobbed a sort of five six hundred pounds of tnt into its bridge or something and blown that to smithereens rendering the ship leaderless and uh probably quite badly on fire and therefore a rather obvious target um obviously daytime use not so great and the advances in searchlight technology and then later radar would have put it well out of business by the time you got to the second world war but it might have developed an interesting niche other things that actually ironically enough the other two things i'll briefly mention went away because again advancing technology made them seem obsolete but actually then came back when technology advanced to a point that they actually became useful again and might have been able to be better researched and developed going uh, at the time that is wire guided torpedoes because everyone thinks world war one world war two torpedoes straight line runners using gyros and then towards the end of World War II, you have acoustic homers and such. Well, the wire-guided torpedo, which is normally seen as the product of the Cold War, was in fact one of the earliest torpedo propulsion uh, gui and guidance, sorry, not propulsion, but guidance mechanisms, albeit that 
due to the uh, rather large and bulky nature of the contraptions they were used for shore defense where the control stations would be mounted on the shore and torpedoes could be driven in uh, to their targets now that fell aside because well torpedoes got faster and longer ranged and were more commonly mounted on ships and the size and shape of the control equipment was considered to be too large etc but potentially if they'd worked on getting those things uh, active for longer periods of time um, and refined the technology, that might have been very successful. I mean, obviously, a, a high-speed shore attack where you're running all over the place and changing course wildly, that is, you are going to end up with broken um, control wires, so it's not so useful in those circumstances. But even aboard destroyers might well be very useful again for the nighttime surprise attacks when you're sneaking up on an enemy that doesn't know you're there and making kind of the last minute course adjustments etc obviously for submarines um albeit that you'd be using the periscope but yeah if you could especially when hunting merchant ships if you could absolutely guarantee or more than 50 percent guarantee you're going to hit with your torpedo because you can see where it's going and steer it it and the merchant really can't do much about it that would be a huge game changer especially for the u-boat arm and even in major battles when you're fighting something that isn't moving and evading with quite the elegance and grace of a destroyer engagement um that might have been very useful i mean fair enough those kind of scenarios are significantly more limited but they do occur so for example rodney fired eight or more torpedoes at bismarck likely only getting one hit now imagine if well i mean it's not going to change the overall outcome of that battle but i suspect the history books might be written slightly differently in terms of battleships effective armament if rodney had wire guided eight heavy 24 and a half inch torpedoes into the side of bismarck um to put it rather mildly the other one is uh, hydrophones as a method of search and destroy or hunter killer operations for submarines so i'm thinking now about the r i think it's the r class maybe the h class can't call offhand but anyway small british attack submarine developed at the end of world war one which relied on using a mass array of hydrophones and a kind of shotgun torpedo spread to hunt enemy submarines now that went by the wayside and then active sonar or as dick at the time was developed and by the second world war that concept wasn't really in in vogue anymore but for those of you who know anything about modern navies or have served in modern navies um the idea of hunting the enemy by listening to hydrophones is pretty much what modern submarine hunter killers do these days so if they'd worked on that a little bit more then I think they might have been onto something. I mean, especially if you're in the business of hunting enemy subs, which, as the Royal Navy, you're more likely to be doing than hunting enemy merchant shipping when you're facing off against the Germans. And that could even have been tied into... I mean, they might have needed a bigger sub, but it could have been tied into the aforementioned if they got some basic wire guidance on the torpedoes, that might have also helped them track down um, and destroy enemy submarines. It's a little bit far-fetched, because you are to a certain extent talking about something you almost imagine being a modern uh method of engagement but the ideas were there um the technology was a little bit too bulky and a little bit crude but with some proper research and development it wouldn't have been necessarily as effective as modern stuff but it certainly beats kind of finger to the wind and hope that a shotgun spread of torpedoes in a 3d environment will catch something james sumpter asks were there any World War II submarines whose hulls were proof against the lighter and uh, aircraft gun calibers, or was any armed aircraft an existential threat to a submarine caught on the surface? Um, kind of. If you were talking about maybe being strafed by an aircraft carrying a couple of low to medium power rifle caliber machine guns, from a relatively long distance like i don't know say being a strafe by ki-43 or something and you were in a submarine with a particularly notably strong hull like say a balao uh, i think that's how it's pronounced class um the successors to the gatos or even the gatos gatos 
the American fleet subs and then their successors that begin with a B. Um, I don't know what you did to the English language Americans, but I have. I, I, I give up. Those things. Anyway, those were built with very strong hulls. So, ironically enough, that's an American sub and Japanese aircraft, two plausible opponents. Um, so, yeah, if you were in a, a I'm going to call it a Balao, um, if you were in a surfaced Balao class and a KO 43 did a high altitude, well, relatively high altitude strafing run over you, maybe to avoid the fire of your deck gun, your hull would probably stand up to it. Um, it's still an existential threat, though, because one, there's a lot of breakable stuff that isn't your hull that you probably don't want broken, like um, your periscope, for instance. And two, you're a submarine. You need to be 100% watertight. The enemy only has to be lucky once. And when they have lots of machine guns, that's a lot of single, small flying lead opportunities to be lucky. So best to treat anything that's shooting at you as an existential threat and get underwater ASAP. Um, the Germans did try the whole flak U-boat uh, arrangement when they got fed up of being forced to submerge while transiting to their operational areas, and it worked briefly um, until the aircraft just came back with more and bigger guns and radar and such like, which, and then it went very badly. So yeah, um, theoretically, yes, there were a number of submarines with very strong and thick hulls for the period, which could withstand some of the lighter, and, uh, lighter aircraft mounted weapons, but I genuinely wouldn't advise trying. Captain First asks, if the 1940 US Navy was seriously concerned about war with Japan, and logically such a war would involve fighting around the Philippines almost immediately, why weren't any battleships sent to join the Asiatic fleet? Was there a logical reason, or was there worry such a move would seem overtly hostile? And surely they realised that ABDA command couldn't stop the concentrated might of the uh, Imperial Japanese Navy without capital ships. So as a theoretical, what difference do you think two or three battleships at Pearl would have made if they were at Luzon instead, or Luzon? Well, firstly, I don't think having capital ships based in the Philippines, certainly in the order of two or three battleships, would have made all that much difference. Um, the Japanese probably would have been rubbing their hands in glee at that, because, well, I think Pearl Harbor was bad. Watch what happens when the uh, the twin-engine bombers get in on the act as well. The Philippines took a fair bit of a pounding already, courtesy of the Imperial Japanese Navy, and if you give them some primary targets like that, well, it's going to be a race between the aircraft and the destroyers and cruisers to see who can put a torpedo into their sides first. In such numbers, they can't possibly hope to win. So there are a number of reasons for not basing the battle fleet out of the Philippines. One of the primary ones was, basically, they didn't have a naval base large enough and developed enough. Uh, during most of the interwar period, the Pacific Fleet was still based out of San Diego on the US West Coast. The move to Pearl Harbor was actually a relatively recent development at the time of the outbreak of World War II, or at least the American involvement in World War II with said attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, so the distance between San Diego and the Philippines is quite considerable, and it had taken them a fair bit of time and effort just to build up Pearl Harbor, let alone um, Luzon or... Cavite or any of the other uh, bases in the Philippines. The other thing was that in the various US war plans, of which War Plan Orange tided them over for planning war with Japan for most of the interwar period, they were still thinking in terms of a somewhat decisive battle doctrine, but also thinking about it in terms of the way most wars had gone on before, with a rise in tension where everybody would kind of see what was about to go down, get ready. Um, get their ships all in order and their defences all in order and thus when the inevitable attack on the Philippines came, which everyone knew would happen in the event of a war between America and Japan it, in short summary they affected the Philippines they expected the Philippines to hold on long enough for the US fleet to come along and relieve it and whether that was a form of direct relief or by starting to take various Japanese held islands in the South and Central Pacific so that the Japanese would get distracted was, well, that's various aspects of uh, the plan, but that was the general idea, at least. So you wouldn't base your fleet on the other side of the ocean from your your main logistics base in the States because 
well, one, that's handing yeah, the enemy all the cards because they can then force a decisive battle well before you might want them to. And also the enemy fleet's going to be relatively well supplied, relatively fresh from home. And no matter how nice you make your overseas base, it's still going to be an overseas base. Your fleet can't possibly be anywhere near as ready. And at the end of the day, with the Philippines so close to Japan, relative to how close they are to the United States, which is to say not at all, the Japanese can come and invade the Philippines a heck of a lot faster than the US can send relief forces. So, um, yeah, putting the Pacific Fleet in the Philippines at that point is very much hanging them out to dry when the Japanese come calling. There, there were even moves to resisting amongst the USN hierarchy, resisting the US Navy moving to Pearl Harbor. Um, so trying to tell them to base out the Philippines, I can just imagine the showdown. But in terms of your question about ABDA command, no one really expected them to be able to hold out. They were hoping that the Japanese capital forces might be distracted by other things, and maybe that ABDA command could hold out against the Japanese cruiser and destroyer forces that were operating in the area. But a lot of war plans that had been drawn up in the interwar period focused around a country fighting another country or a country with allies fighting another country. Um, there weren't really any war plans that said, well, what happens if we end up fighting Germany, Italy, etc. in Europe and also happen to be fighting Japan on the other side of the planet because nobody could see uh, any kind of connection between the two is why why would we fight both of them at once their interests are completely different um but then that's what i say as the saying goes reality doesn't have to make sense fiction has to follow rules dp asks if the designs for the sumner dash gearing classes had been developed earlier or if the war had gone on longer, etc. Given the more effective systems and potential for the number of hulls to be built, given how fast the US like to churn out destroyers, what do you think the chances are that the gearings would firstly outnumber and then outperform and take over the legendary status or reputation that the Fletchers earned and still hold historically? To be honest, I don't think it would quite get to the same levels as the Fletchers did, and that's for two main reasons, size and related cost. So the gearings are 30-ish percent heavier by displacement than a Fletcher, which means a lot more material, which in turn means that they are going to take longer to build individually, even if that's only slightly, and also it means that they're going to be more expensive. And in fact, the level of expense is slightly disproportional to their overall cost and in as much as they actually cost more per ton than a Fletcher does in large part because of those more advanced and effective systems and even the mighty USA has limits um, the US spent a heck of a lot of money in World War II on its various naval systems and it also needed resources I mean the by the end of the war, the US was churning out so many ships, there was steel shortages, so things like the Alaskas got held up because it, it was they were just running out of... Uh, well, not running out of, but they had a supply bottlenecks of the, cor the correct types of steels to build warships out of. Um, so if you're building a swarm of gearing Dash Sumner-class destroyers, yes, you will still build an awful lot of them, and yes, you will have a gearing swarm, but individually, they're going to take slightly longer to get into the heart, into the water compared to the Fletchers. Um, they're a slightly larger um, investment per ton, so the for the same amount of money, you get fewer of them. And as I say, individually, they take a bit longer to get out. And even if you throw the same amount, the sort of money at them, equipped to get the equivalent number of holes that you do for the Fletchers, again, time is not on your side there. And as they are individually larger investments with larger crews, etc., etc. There's not to say the US Navy is suddenly going to become incredibly risk-averse, but there may be marginal situations where Fletchers could be sent in where the US might go, mm, maybe not. Not that there's that many of them, but sometimes it's those marginal situations that can lead to the great heroic actions that can make or break a ship's reputation. And that can go both ways. I mean, it, it could be that 
they'll accomplish even more going into a marginal situation. But it could also be that, say, for something like the Battle of Samar, a gearing might be considered a bit too much of uh, a fleet destroyer to be, quote unquote, uh, wasted escorting a bunch of escort carriers. And there may just be a bunch of destroyer escorts stuck there while the, the gearings go off with the real fleet, uh, which will probably then end relatively badly for TAF E3. Um, so, yeah, between those minor um, situations, well, not that the Battle of Samar was minor, but you get the idea of minor dis decision changes and their increased size and cost. I don't think a gearing summoner swarm would quite match the Fletcher swarm. Type here asks, between adding length and throwing in more engine, which was the preferable thing to go for when trying to get a ship to go faster? Ah, now that's a very specific question, and well done for asking. Um, so it does get a little bit technical, um, but essentially, in general terms, adding length is slightly better. There are situations where adding more engine is, is superior, and I will explain. What it comes down to is the length to beam ratio, or if, um, and I know this, this is probably an incredibly niche audience, but if there's any of you out there who have graduated from Kingston University at some point in the uh, mid to late 2000s onwards and happen to know Professor Donchev, um, and it's not length to beam, it's length to beam. Um, sorry, I just had to get that in there. <laughs> but anyway, going on, the, the length to beam ratio of a ship in many ways determines how fast you're going to be able to go for a given amount of horsepower. Now, obviously, there is other factors to consider, things like your hull form, how deep your dra the draft of your ship is, what your overall density of the ship is, um, and so on and so forth, so forward cross-sectional area, frow numbers, uh, you've got to run the Bernoulli equations, how many propeller shafts you've got... Um, it, it, it gets very complicated and you get into engineering hydraulics and I must shut up about it before I go really off the deep end because oh, that, that was a fun, fun course at uni. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, so get, getting getting back to the realm of the, 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 uh, the slightly non-esoteric, um, you generally want something approaching a six to one beam ratio, length to beam ratio, give or take. And from there, you can make the ship shorter and stouter, which will make you more agile, or you can make it slightly longer and thinner, which will make you faster but less agile. And obviously it also affects things like stability, overall internal volume, relative to your surface area and such like. So battleships will tend to be slightly on the shorter side of that, that um, equation, whereas things like battle cruisers and cruisers will tend to be on the longer side of that equation. And that's why if you look at overhead shots, you will sometimes see that a big heavy cruiser might approach the length, or in some cases even exceed the length, of a roughly contemporary battleship, but will displace half or a third or a quarter even of the displacement of a contemporary capital ship because it's so much thinner and usually also has a slightly a shallower draft. Um, the, the lack of massive belt armor also helps, but it, it's generally more to do with the, just the sheer volume of it being so much reduced. Now, all of that comes around to the fact that if you increase that length to beam ratio, you improve the hydrodynamics of the ship, and there's a whole lot of complicated um, equations that go into that. So again, because I don't want to spend the rest of the dry dock talking about the hydrodynamic principles of hull design, um, just take my word for it. And who knows, maybe I'll do a special on that at some point. Talk about Froud numbers and uh, Froud's tank, etc. Anyway, stop it, Drac. Um, yes, yeah, so you, you could increase the, the length of your ship and that will improve your speed to a degree. 
and it's it's relatively free. I mean, it's not entirely obviously you have to pay the cost, but uh, in financial terms, but in terms of hydrodynamic performance, ship stability, etc., it's a modest plug in the middle of your ship to increase its length is a relatively nice way of adding a bit more speed to your vessel. The limit to that comes in when you're looking at something like a already long battle cruiser or cruiser because if you start adding significant length to those ships that's when you start to get the kind of high speed sailing knife blade scenario where you suddenly start to have serious issues with stability and also serious issues with turning um and and yeah if you want to go in a straight line a nine to one length to beam ratio you'll be absolutely fine um just hope you don't end up crosswise to a particularly large wave or ha want to conduct any kind of combat maneuver that requires a turning radius of less than the size of a large city um <laughs> so yeah in those circumstances where you already have a fairly um fine length to beam ratio then that's when you want to throw more engine power in um the other time when you if you if you for throwing more engine power in is if you've got a relatively light ship already because you can well not that you want to do this with a large ship but say with some with something small like a frigate or something um putting in a significant amount of extra power if the whole shape will allow for it might then push the ship up and out of the water somewhat which can have some worrying effects on stability but the less ship you have in the water the less resistance you have and if you're coupling that with a lot more power you can kind of speed boat up your way to victory but that's kind of reserved for small frigates corvettes fast attack ships and things like that you if, put it this way if you found yourself doing a say 40 45 knots in a two and a half thousand ton destroyer skipping your hull across the water in the manner of a speedboat it'll be cool and fine for about the next five minutes and then it will end in blood tears explosions and wreckage over the water so yeah maybe leak those plans to your enemies first the lost beaver asks a number of questions so well, let's go through them one to four one i know that australia had a naval base that was also commissioned that being the hmas platypus is it or was it practice common practice to commission naval bases and why was this done Two, how important are survey vessels and other scientific vessels such as meteorological ships to a fleet's operations? Three, I've heard that some of the Australian colonies possessed small fleets of their own before the country became Australia. Was this standard practice and how useful would these navies have been in defending the colony from attack or invasion? And four, I'm currently reading about the HMAS Adelaide, the 1922 edition, and I can see it took seven years to complete. Why? So the delays to the construction of HMS Adelaide were many and varied, but broadly it comes down to two things. One, it was started when there was a war on, and two, Australian shipyards. And that's not a general slight at Australian uh, industry as a whole. It's simply the fact that, as we've discussed in a number of other videos, in order to maintain a efficient and professional shipbuilding industry, you have to not quite all completely, but near enough, have a continuous stream of ship orders going on. And if you ever are going to enter a period where you're not going to be ordering any new ships, you need to have a nice set of modernizations, refits, etc., going to keep skills up. Now, Australia in 1915, back when the Adelaide was laid down, did not have a particularly spectacular tradition of naval ship construction, nor did it have much of a continuity in this regard. And so the shipyards, despite their best efforts, could not match the efficiency, speed, problem solving, etc., 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 of a shipyard that had been building warships continuously for a couple of centuries, for example. So that was part of it. The other part of it related to the fact it's a relatively new shipbuilding industry. It meant that they just couldn't manufacture all the various parts. And that meant you had to get them from someone who could. And the people who could 
manufacture the very specific parts for the Adelaide, being that it was a sub-variant of a sub-variant of a town-class cruiser, were the British. And the British, in 1915, 1916, 17, 18, were involved in this small thing called World War One, which, to be fair, so was Australia. Um, but it did mean that, well, the priority for bits of town-class cruiser remained in the UK where the town glass cruisers were in combat with various German ships and it was a little bit risky sending such parts out over to Australia because there was every chance that a surface raider or submarine might blow up the transport and send all the bits to the bottom uh, which in fact did actually happen at one point so <laughs> wartime shortages effectively and coupled with the, the industries being relatively young, because if the industry had been established, they would have been able to build those parts as long as they had the materials themselves without having to worry about importing them from overseas. And then finally was the fact that, again, she was started in 1915, and then you had things like the Battle of Jutland and the Second Battle of Heligoland Bight, etc., etc., and lessons coming in from the early part of the war as well, which showed various lessons in you might think that changes you might want to make in terms of power, armament, armor, etc., etc. All various uh, modifications that you get out of wartime experience. And so a wartime delayed shipyard that didn't have much experience building something the size of a modern light cruiser and was also missing a few key parts also was now faced with having to modify the design on the fly. <laughs> um, and then, of course straight after world war one there were budget cuts which slowed things down even further so yeah that's that's how it takes near enough almost not quite but near enough a decade to build a cruiser seven years uh, from lay down to launch and of course commission now as far as the various australian colonies the one things that will eventually become the states of australia yeah they did have small operational fleets of their own um it was mostly for the period a kind of standard practice. They were, they were effectively um, more on the revenue protection side of Coast Guard than active fleets, if you take my meaning. Um, so they're there to sort of regulate trade, protect trade, protect customs duties, check on shipping, etc., etc. They had They were armed and they were able, certainly as you drew on through the uh, 18th and 19th century, they became more and more capable of combat, but they were still very much a colonial force, mostly designed for local security uh, and support with the Royal Navy, supposed to be in the background with the Australia Squadron to provide the heavy hitting against potentially hostile enemy forces. And obviously that gradually would be handed over to the actual Royal Australian Navy as that formed. In terms of defending the colony from attack invasion, probably not fantastically effective. Mainly on the grounds, not so much that they couldn't defeat hostile naval forces. I could think of any number of small navies that they probably could have uh, defeated. The main problem is that Australia is really far away. <laughs> Which basically means that anybody capable of sending a fleet to attack or invade Australia, or a part of a fleet or whatever, is probably a fairly substantial player on the naval field, which in turn means that the force that's going to show up is itself also going to be fairly substantial and nasty. So if they're serious about it, no, the, the, the colonial fleets would not have been able to, to stop them. Um, the odd cruiser raid or whatever... Yeah, sure, they might pull that off, but that would be more a case of dodging in, in and between the various patrolling ships because uh, a, a single raiding cruiser definitely doesn't want to engage warships where it can at all avoid it because one lucky hit can end its career. Now, by the time you had, as I said, the Royal Australian Navy and they formed their own um, sort of Australia squadron, then things changed substantially. Uh, when you had, say, the battle cruiser HMAS Australia, Von Spey took one look with his East Asia squadron, took one look at the Australians and went, mm, no, I'm going to go to the other side of the Pacific. 
Uh, the, the Japanese Navy kind of helped with that assessment, but given that Australia was one of the historically listed pre-war targets for the German East Asia Squadron, yeah, have, having a game changer like that was was von Spee's signal to skedaddle. In terms of survey vessels and other vessels like meteorological ships, they're very important to a navy. Um, there's a reason that for a significant portion of the 19th and 20th century, most navies and merchant ships used Admiralty charts, and that's because the Admiralty had basically the best charts from the various surveys they'd sent out across the world. If you don't have good surveys from reliable sources, which are obviously the best sources if you've got the funding for it will be your own survey vessels, especially in home waters when you don't want the enemy or anyone else to know exactly how they're charted. Yeah, if you don't have those maps, smashing into a rock can really ruin your whole day. Um, and that's when you're not having to hit mobile bits of the scenery like oil tankers and such like. And the same with meteorological um, stuff. Remember, even in World War II and thereafter, full-on modern warships were swamped and sunk in really bad storms. Okay, fair enough, the destroyers, but still, that's a lot of money and a lot of men gone down. Um, so you still need to understand the weather, predict and report on the weather. And if you can't do that, when you don't have an ally who can reliably do that for you, well, I wouldn't want to be serving in that particular navy if it was in a part of the world that has hurricanes or typhoons or cyclones, etc. And then finally, before we move on to Patreon questions, commissioning naval bases. Yes, it was practice and to a certain extent still is. And that largely grows out of the fact that originally um, a lot of what are now naval bases started out as warships that were either retired or decommissioned and then recommissioned for their purpose. So... Um, various Royal Navy bases you might have heard of, like, say, HMS Excellent, HMS Vernon, HMS Britannia, uh, etc., etc. All of these were active warships first, and then they were brought in at the end of their useful service lives to form accommodation ships and or the actual school its or base itself, uh, the substantial part of it, and so they were still commissioned warships and that kind of bled out into well if you've got a base that's named after a ship then if you've got another base well we'll name that after a ship as well uh, but if we're naming a thing after a ship is it technically a ship so should we commission it well best to be on the safe side um it depends navy by navy some navies will just commission their naval bases because they are as much an integral part of the navy as the warships themselves and they're kind of small self-contained communities just like warships so the justification does vary but yes it's in many navies the practice to commission naval bases is around and one of the root causes of that is because a lot of early naval bases were either based around or entirely based on uh, older warships which were commissioned vessels tc green asks uh he says i assume perhaps incorrectly that a baltimore class could have defeated a HMS Dreadnought rather easily in one-on-one -on -one duel. If I'm correct, at what point did heavy cruisers of any nation match or surpass the Dreadnought? So there are a number of ways of looking at this. If you want to look at it in terms of armour penetration capability, technically never, because a... well, the HMS Dreadnought with capped APC is always going to outperform um, any realistic heavy cruiser, even the uh, eight inch 55 calibers on des moines can't match the dreadnought's armor p penetration capability and of course dreadnought is protected at least in theory against its own weapons so in a penetration of armor contest the dreadnought's always going to win however that's not the only factor in question i think you can probably identify roughly two points at which heavy cruisers from various nations got to the point where they could comfortably beat the Dreadnought in a one-on-one -on -one fight. For the Imperial Japanese Navy, I would say this point was reached in roughly the mid-1930s with the introduction of the Long Lance Torpedo, and that's because the Long Lance Torpedo 
has an effective range that's considerably greater than both the absolute range and also the effective range of the Dreadnought's guns. Which means that a Japanese cruiser could sail into visual range of the Dreadnought and allow the Dreadnought to close on it or maintain a distance because obviously the Japanese cruiser is going to have much superior speed or whatever it likes in order to bait the Dreadnought into a relatively straight line course because of course the Dreadnought's going to, not going to imagine torpedoes can be fired over that kind of range. Ripple fire a bunch of long lances out and that's probably going to be it. If you get a hit or two, the Dreadnought's either sunk or it's going to be sunk very soon thereafter and the cruiser can come in and finish it off. So that's one way of um, ensuring that you have significantly um, overmatched the Dreadnought with the cruiser. And the other thing, bearing in mind we're talking about heavy cruisers, that's 8-inch guns, so we can't go with the kind of endless hail of fire that a 6-inch cruiser might be able to put out, relatively speaking. Um is to look at fire control systems. Now, for this, it all matters as, almost as much as when, when we're considering Dreadnought, because the HMS Dreadnought in 1906 is a considerably different beast in terms of how far away it can engage and uh, accurately as compared to HMS Dreadnought at the end of World War I, uh, after various wartime refits and equipment upgrades and improvements. The main reason I say this is that the other way that a heavy cruiser could be said to be able to defeat the Dreadnought is effectively if it can stay beyond Dreadnought's effective gunnery range, it can shell it with impunity. And the effective gunnery range is always going to be much shorter than the actual maximum gunnery range. So th th this is a possibility. Now the main problem that you're going to face is that you can't just go, oh well... Radar directed, um, Mark 37 fire control, or similar, and just say, oh, we're going to sit at 25,000 yards and shell away. Yeah, sure, you'd be beyond Dreadnought's ability to respond, and you'll eventually get a hit, <laughs> but your flight time of your shell is going to be more like 40 seconds, at which point a Dreadnought, just by steering by the flashes of your guns, is going to infinitely evade your shells. So it'll be safe, but you're not going to accomplish a lot you're going to have to close in probably to about 15-ish thousand yards to get a shelf flight time where you can actually reliably hit the thing. Unfortunately, at 15,000 yards, it uh, Dreadnought's guns are going to come straight through most heavy cruisers, um, and just enough with the fuse initiated, which is going to be bad. So at that point, you want to be able to hit fast, hit hard, hit often, and this is where your fire control systems can be vital because you're not you've not got a refire rate that's fantastically more than dreadnought if dreadnought gets desperate so at that point you are probably looking at again around about the mid to late 1930s where your fire control systems have gotten to a point of accuracy such that you can probably lay in a gun a uh, gun setting and then using your slightly higher rate of fire dial it in then start hitting dreadnought before it starts hitting you now of course you do run the risk at this point if you're saying at 50,000 yards dreadnought might get lucky have a good gunnery officer and just blow you clean out of the water with the second or third salvo but if you're going to run this simulation a hundred times and you so let's say we're operating at around 15,000 yards by the time you get reasonably decent fire rates on 8-inch guns with good fire control systems. And let's face it, by the mid to late 1930s, your fire control systems are pretty decent. Then at that point, yeah, you could probably bring a Dreadnought down by death of a thousand cuts, just lob HE and AP at its superstructure and set everything on, on fire and smash the stuff that won't burn. So a Baltimore class, yeah, could defeat Dreadnought one-on-one -on -one. that's entirely within the realms of plausibility and its immediate predecessors probably could as well as anything any heavy cruiser that was fully up to spec from about the mid-30s onwards would probably stand a better than even chance but 
outside of the haha look at me I'm launching torpedoes at you from 25,000 yards away approach that the Japanese Navy could go for everything else is going to have to get in range where if Dreadnought gets lucky you're dead so not without risk Timo Fiebich asks when cannons first came to Europe how fast did various navies back then react to it relatively swiftly actually um the first as far as we can tell first recorded use of cannons in the in Europe in the medieval period was around about the start of the 14th century the first couple of decades and cannons first appear on a ship within a couple of decades of that but then now that's not to suggest that cannons were very common um they certainly weren't and it's 14th century cannons had a distressing habit of exploding and scattering the crew themselves and lots of bits of burning hot metal all over the place, which is not really something you want when you're on a small wooden warship covered in uh, men and burnables. So they didn't really catch on <laughs> for a while. Although in calmer waters, they were used in places like the Mediterranean aboard ships but not specifically for ship to ship combat although you could in a pinch try for that they were more used as uh, shore artillery uh, anti-shore bombardment artillery um where where their sort of very slow rate of fire etc could be more easily managed because that was one of the other things 14th century cannon took forever and a day to reload so not particularly practical for seaborne combat Cannons would increase slightly in various areas aboard ships uh, across Europe in various guises during the 14th and most of the 15th century. A lot of that was to do with a proliferation of smaller pieces for help with boarding actions and such, rather than the big guns that we think of these days, say, apart from the uh, fortress bombardment weapons. And it was towards the end of the 15th century when people started, especially in uh, places like Portugal, started to reinforce the decks of uh, existing ships so that they could mount heavy guns on the broadside. And once you could mount heavy guns on the broadside, then you could start to have, well, shockingly enough, broadside guns, and then you could go into ship-to-ship combat now. Yeah, end of the 15th century guns are still relatively long on the reload and the naval carriage the sort of the short small four-wheeled naval carriage as we envisage it was not quite there yet a lot of these mountings still resembled the two-wheeled land-based siege gun mountings which made things even slower um which in terms of reload and stuff because you had to really manhandle them around but yeah, the late latter part of the 15th century is when you started to see some practical use of them and then it kind of developed over that period in into the 16th century. And by the time you get to the mid-16th century, they're very firmly part of a ship's armament um, for whatever purposes you want to put them to. Robert Henry Ilston asks, Did any navies from 1914 to the Cold War try to develop a point defence system against torpedoes? Now, I think I answered this in the previous Patreon Dry Dock special, so I'm going to say check that. I do remember answering something along those lines. If you think you've asked a slightly different question to the one that I did answer, um, please let me know, and I will, of course, uh, visit revisit this question. Leon Wu asks, uh, how do watches work on a ship? Are there three watches doing eight-hour days, four doing six hours, etc.? Now, this one I know I have answered very recently in a dry dock. So, um, again, I refer you to that dry dock's answer. And, again, if you feel that that answer was not sufficient, then please let me know. And, once again, I will revisit it. Sui420den asks a triperit question. Who is the most insane admiral or captain in the history of the Royal Navy? What are the best warship nicknames? And has there been one particular ship which gained a particularly fearsome reputation in an opposing navy? Well, if you go all the way back to Drynock episode 21, 
Uh, there's a couple of minutes there on warship nicknames, so uh, I'll direct, again I'll direct you to that one um, to avoid repetition, and that allows me some time, more time to answer your other questions. Now, as far as insane admirals or captains of the Royal Navy, that one's actually a pretty hard one, um, mostly because for all the sort of upper class nitwittery that occasionally infected the Royal Navy's upper echelons. Someone who was genuinely mad tended to get quietly shuffled off into a corner with a straitjacket long before they got anywhere close to a position of command because, well, there's a system of patronage and then there's a person who will actively put the ship in danger of being lost and the Royal Navy doesn't tolerate that very well. Um, now, that's insane, but as they often say, the line between insanity and genius is very, very thin. So when you want to sort of expand that, maybe look at things that people who are described as rather eccentric or uh, or mad in the old way of saying things, you come across a few. But when you look at it, it's actually, as I say, it's very difficult to tell what is in that respect is eccentricity or madness and what's actually strokes of unrecognised genius. For example, although breaking the line was generally seen, well, not commonly, albeit not so commonly used, but still seen as a, a good idea in the Age of Sail, Nelson was considered reckless to the point of madness for disregarding orders and hurling his relatively small third rate into the middle of a Spanish fleet that was significantly stronger than his one ship. But, given the outcome, it's Lord a genius. If he'd been killed, or HMS Captain had been dismas uh, dismasted and uh, sunk, damaged, or captured, everyone would have called him mad. Um, I think of all the engagements and such, like where you could point, point to something that succeeded, but was still utterly bonkers insane... I would probably have to point to Admiral Hawke at the Battle of Kiberon Bay, where, bearing in mind we are in wooden sailing ships, where the most advanced navigational instruments are sextants, sundials, and the human eye, he found a French fleet in the aforementioned bay, chased it, and then as a gale rose and night fell, neither of which are particularly conducive um, times to be in a sailing ship generally, but especially not together, and especially not close to land, he went you know, what stuff, it all sails to full, we are going into this battle come hell or high water and probably both are not too far away <laughs> um, and promptly led uh, his fleet charging off into the darkness and storms with as many sails set as would hold without blowing out that yeah, that, that, that's pretty lunatic. Um, I mean, much as I criticise Halsey for leading his ship into two typhoons, Halsey at, ver at, the, at the very least didn't try and uh, sail into a gunfight with the uh, remaining Japanese capital ships in the middle of a typhoon. Um, Hawk pretty much did. <laughs> um, he won, which is why it's not seen as uh, madness, it's seen as genius, but by any reasonable metric, that's quite bad. Now, as far as ships with particularly fearsome reputations are concerned, in the last couple of hundred years, it's a little bit difficult, mostly because sh there weren't that many combats for a ship to build up of fearsome reputation. I mean, even in World War One and World War Two, when there was a lot of individual conflicts, um, to find a ship running through multiple engagements to the point that they would end up building up that kind of reputation with an enemy was relatively rare. It, it kind of did happen on occasion. Um, war Spite it did get something of a reputation for it at the time, albeit that a lot of War Spite's reputation is not entirely, but uh, some of it is built up Sort of post fact, looking at its its achievements in retrospect, um, going further back to the age of sail, where again you had long wars with very many engagements, and where the few big uh, 
heavy ships could be found repeatedly showing up that's where you tend to get um fearsome reputations building up around them especially because when the technology levels were all a little bit over the place it can get very um very sort of very disproportionate and then a ship that is already larger and more technologically advanced can gain an absolutely ridiculous reputation for just tearing into things left right and center i mean switching briefly back to the uh the more modern era ships like hms warrior hms dreadnought for obvious reasons um the hood in the interwar period um bismarck and Tirpitz in allied propaganda and so on all had fearsome reputations for various lengths of time but they were mostly built up on what they could theoretically do rather than what they actually did do um the, the most obvious example that jumps to mind from the age of sail for example would actually be the sovereign of the seas or as the dutch called her the golden devil and that was precisely a situation of what i was uh, referring to earlier it was just a socking great first well at the time they didn't technically have it but we might as well call it first rate ship of the line in a war where nobody had a ship of that size not even not even the the royal navy at that point had another ship that could match it the dutch definitely didn't um and between its heavy construction massive numbers of guns and although they took off the most ostentations of it still a fair bit of gilding the sh the sovereign of the seas would quite often just cruise through battles to or not a certain extent almost regardless of what everyone else was doing and just shoot at and board various things that came into passing range. Occasionally, that came a little bit close to um, pushing it, pushing its luck too far. But it was big enough, mean enough, and obvious enough that if it ever did get into difficulties, um, other British ships could show up and uh, and give it a hand. Not that it needed them that that often and so for the dutch who as i said were mostly forced to use smaller and lighter vessels as a result of their relatively shallow coastline seeing this thing just wandering around effectively just executing whatever it felt like yeah it gained a bit of a reputation during uh, a couple of the anglo-dutch wars to say the least and that brings us to the end of the Q&A section. Just a little bit of channel admin. I'm sure a number of you have been watching the news and I know a bunch of you have messaged and emailed me about the current world situation and thus how that may or may not affect my trip to the States in a few weeks. As of the time of recording, which is uh, Friday evening 13th of March, we're currently in a situation where travel to and from the European Union Schengen travel area has been uh, suspended to the US for period unknown. However, at the moment, at least, the UK is exempt. Personally, um, I feel fine. I don't appear to have any symptoms, and so I don't think I've got the coronavirus, and I'm taking reasonable precautions against catching it. Um... At the moment, in terms of the day job, still expected to go into the office, albeit they are enacting a number of control measures to minimise exposure. Um, and so, as again, as it stands, it looks like the trip is still on. A number of museum ships, unfortunately, uh, have indicated that they are either shutting or limiting access for the minute. Uh, but not all of them. Uh, so, and some of them, like, say, USS Salem, which I'm planning to visit while I'm in Boston, they're not opening in March, but they said they are going to open in April. So, well, I'm there in April, so I, I guess that works for me. Um, so, yeah, at, at the moment, America trip's still on. If that changes, I will try and keep people informed via these channel admin sections in the... Uh, dry dock so it's there as a matter of public record and for reference unless and until one of the following circumstances occur i will still be intending to travel the only circumstances in which i will not be going on the trip is if obviously travel 
um, to and from the US uh, and the via the UK is forbidden, then, well, that kind of puts a little bit of a, pro a kibosh on it because I physically can't get there. My swimming skills are not that good, unfortunately. Um, and if the situation develops in such a manner within the US that travel between the states is suspended, uh, sort of airlines shutting down routes and such like, because I do have what, one, two, three, three internal, four and three or four internal flights to catch. So obviously if they're suspended um, with the best will in the world, I'm not driving from Charleston to Mobile and then on to San Diego. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully that won't come to pass or if it does come to pass, hopefully it will only be for a week or two and uh, by the time I head out there everything will have calmed down a bit but we shall see how it all goes. Um, as long as basically as long as travel is still available I'll be going if some of the ships are shut that's a shame but I know a lot of you have put aside time and resources to come and say hi so hey if it, if if all we can do is look from the quayside and take a few pretty photos and then go and sit down and talk about warships and find good food to eat for the day that's not the worst holiday in the world <laughs> by a long shot and I've been advised there are a few nice naval memorabilia and other um, bookshops and such like that I can visit while I'm there. So there are some backup plans. And as I say, hopefully, uh, I know some of the ships have offered to show me around um, as a kind of an, an individual tour thing. So hopefully that might get around any kind of limitations on large numbers. But again... We shall see. It seems to be a developing situation, and we've still got, as of today, what, one, two, three weeks before, exactly three weeks before takeoff. So, fingers crossed. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to this last rambly bit, if indeed you still are, and I shall see you all again in another video soon. Thank you very much.